Hello and welcome back once again to the Inquisitor podcast with me, Marcus Kauke. Today, my guest is Paul Fifield. Paul is CEO of the Sales Impact Academy. Paul, welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, welcome. Uh, hi, in fact. <laughs> That's right. I don't mind. You can interview me if you like. Um, <laughs> welcome, welcome to your own podcast. <laughs> excellent. Very good. So tell me this. Um, can you give us about 60 seconds on your history? And what got you to the point where you were angry enough to come on this show? <laughs> <laughs> 60 seconds. Okay, I'll be really quick. So I've been sort of building and, and running companies for the last 20 years. I was scratching around in a very different industry for the first 10. I was kind of in like in the agency world, which doesn't really scale and is a pretty demoralizing industry to work in. And then I pivoted out of that and co-founded a SaaS company in New York, raised a bunch of capital, built a company called Seros. And uh, happily today, that's now uh, probably worth north of 600 million and doing, doing very well. A private equity firm bought half of it last year. I then, after building the foundations of that company, came back to the UK and I joined a company called Unidays. And I should say when I was at Seros, I was kind of focused on the revenue function, right? So I was building the revenue function. I was yeah. a co-founder there, but I was, a, I, was, I was the CRO. I then had a CRO gig at Unidays, and we took revenue there from two to 40 million in three years. I built like a 100 plus person commercial team in four countries. And uh, that was a great success too. We actually scaled that without any, even any external, external capital. Left there and then started just randomly just doing teaching. I kind of love teaching and helping people out. I did stuff for the London Mayor's International Business Program. I did stuff for PwC and I was really doing classes around how you build predictable, the basics of how you build predictable, scalable revenue functions. And that's when I realized that <laughs> no one had a clue, much in the same way that I really didn't have much of a clue through my career. I was learning as I went along. And I was like, wow, this, 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 this kind of like sick, scared feeling that I had as a, sort <laughs> of re as a revenue leader thinking, I don't, I don't even know what I don't know. It's really stressful. I wish I, I, wish I had some kind of formal learning or something. I realized through my teaching that this was a massive, like massive industry-wide problem. And, uh, and so I've set about trying to solve that through building, you know, a fit for purpose education company to really upskill go-to-market teams the world over. And you're then developing uh, managers and managing those teams as well? Yeah, absolutely. We're building out an education solution. It's, it's live instruction. Everything we teach is, is, is live, but we record it as well. We don't teach too much in, in a week. It's just two hours of learning. But what we're building out is a complete curriculum of learning for every single persona within a kind of B2B go-to-market operation. So that's sales and customer success and sales engineering and revenue operations and managers and frontline, you know, literally SDRs, right up to CROs, CMOs, and, and chief, chief customer officers. Okay. So that's really interesting. You probably have some fairly strong views on adult education and why training doesn't work. I do, yes. <laughs> One or two. <laughs> Go ahead. The floor is yours. Okay, well, I think my first gripe that I have is with the education system. Now, the, the biggest irony of what I'm doing, and not with the biggest irony, but, but a small irony, is that I don't have a degree. You know, I'm now building... You know, we you know we grew nine hundred percent year on year in the last twelve months. It's going you know absolutely kind of bonkers. It's probably up there with one of the fastest growing subscription companies, SaaS companies in in Europe, which is obviously incredibly exciting. But what's kind of what's kind of funny is I don't have a degree. But I did I did actually start two degrees. I just didn't finish either of them. The second the last one I did two years was doing pretty well, and then I you could do a year in industry, but I decided to go and set up a company because apparently you're allowed to do that, and I, I sort of never looked back. But my major first gripe is with the global education system, which surely is one of its principal tasks is to ensure that the, the, the world has enough of the right kind of talent, right? Surely that's one of its most principal tasks so that people then go into the, into the kind of like economy and contribute very positively in jobs like law, like finance, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Why then? Why? did the entire global education system totally overlook sales as a profession? It's literally, and I've, I've, I've you know, oft, often quoted with this, I think it's the greatest educational travesty of the last 50 years. I literally want to shake people. <laughs> like, what have you done? 
right? There are, according to LinkedIn, 60 million people just in sales, right? And, and for so long, I think the industry, the education industry is like scoffed, laughed at, and kind of like mi minimized sales as a profession. It's the kind of thing you do if you're a bit stupid and you haven't got a degree. Slowly changing, but what it's meant is there's no curriculum anywhere for, to, for, for salespeople and go-to-market teams. And what's compounded the problem is that the complexity of running a modern go-to-market function is now absolutely easily as complex as medicine. It's easily as complex as, as law, easily as complex as finance. And so you've got this nightmare scenario where you've got this highly complex profession without any, without any kind of educational infrastructure around it. And it, I think it's absolutely shocking and it's absolutely appalling. And it's having so a, things, a macro impact on, on economies. It's being seen in the results. Part of the problem with results there may well be uh, unrealistic expectations, but if they actually operated effectively, then those stretch goals wouldn't even be uh, be considered to be difficult. Mm -hmm. And the skills that you're talking about are life skills: listening, questioning, empathy, learning how to find the common ground, reaching agreement. You know, th these are skills that anyone would benefit from, but they don't appear anywhere in the curriculum. So I think there's a tendency where accountants run things to look at um, it as line items. And I think part of the challenge that we've got is that government is often run through the balance sheet. Companies are frequently run or always run through the balance sheet. And if you look at the motivation behind the money behind a company, that will permeate into the culture and into the behavior mm -hmm. of the people on the ground facing customers. And I, certainly over the last 35 years since I've been in sales, I've seen the customer become less and less important and more and more divorced from the actual development of products. Sales is more transactional than ever. And part of this comes down to the technology spaghetti that people have um, spent their money on, hoping that it would be you know, the, the great hope that lobbing some cash at the problem would make it go away, and it hasn't. No, because the most important, to, to run a successful revenue function in a, in, a, in, a, in a B2B company, selling a relatively complex product, the absolutely most important thing, it's not your tech stack, it's not like how much stuff you have in there, it's does your team know what they're doing? <laughs> do they have the core skills as an SDR, as an AE, as a CS rep, right? Do they, do they have the core skills to literally do the job day to day and be effective? And if they don't, you're screwed. And if they do, then great, you've done a, you've done, you've done a great job. But building a team with all the right core skills is the challenge. And so this then brings us to, very neatly, the function of managers um, before we then look at the kind of training and support they need. Mm -hmm. and giving so in your mind what are the functions of managers in sales well i mean it's a it's a pretty it's a pretty tough it's a pretty tough job right and you could almost argue it's like an impossible job and i i you know i remember as a C, cro in my two stints i used to have a to-do list I, it was like you know it was just an unrealistic to-do list no human being could possibly get through get through everything and it was really a, a, a case of like which fires can i just keep keep allowing to burn and burn and burn and burn and burn and burn. Because the problem is like, as a revenue leader, you've got so much to be thinking about. I mean, you, you've, got, you've got a target on your back, obviously. You've got to be thinking about hiring. You've got to be thinking about onboarding. You've got to be thinking about, you know, all the stuff around the kind of like the product itself and just en enabling people around, around the product. You've got reporting. You've got, I mean, it's just the, just, just the list kind of goes, goes on and on positioning. And it just goes on and on and on. And then on top of all that, you've got to then, because of this education problem, you've now got to teach people how to do the job as well. So if you think like, if you, if you like go into a different profession for a second and, and say like law, imagine if you're a manager of lawyers and not only should you have manager whole team and all the stuff that goes along with that, you had to teach the lawyers how to do law. <laughs> yes. That would just be, it'd be like, what? That's preposterous. Okay. That's exactly what happens in sales management, sales leadership. But here's the other problem. And this is, I'll be, I'll be very honest with you. So I didn't spend much time as an, as an AE. So I, I actually, I was actually 
a pretty bad AE manager because I didn't even really know how to support and develop the AEs themselves. But even that, every revenue leader, because again, we've all had to learn on the job, has these massive gaps in their knowledge. Really, most revenue leaders or managers aren't very good teachers because they have themselves all these kind of gaps in their knowledge. So it's a, it's a, it's a kind of a bit of a, the whole thing's just really a kind of a bit of a mess. It beggars the obvious question, which is, as a new incoming CRO, slow down and make it clear before you accept the role that you need to step back. But I think that takes a lot of courage, especially where you've got investors yelling for a pipeline, new logos, and new revenue. Yeah. I mean, that, good, good luck. <laughs> good, good luck with that one. But the, the economics of doing it the way most VC and private equity-backed companies do it mm -hmm. holds water when money is cheap to borrow. Mm -hmm. So it's really a race against when interest rates start to correct, isn't it? To, I guess to an extent. But like, look, I think as, as long as the core, the, as long as the, the core fundamentals, as a, a, a fundamentals of the company are strong. Then you'll, you'll, you'll raise money in, in, in any market, no matter what the kind of like you know interest rate is. I think you make an interesting point about slowing down, right? But which is a different topic altogether. Which is how do you know how, how fast you should be going, or if you're going too fast, right? Like how do you how do you instrument your business and your revenue function to, to know which speed you should go at? And I think it's a really kind of interesting question. Thankfully, we've got um, investment from Stage Two Capital um, out of Boston. Uh, Mark Roberge is one of the co-founders there. He was obviously CRO at HubSpot, wrote probably one of the best books on sales called Sales Acceleration Formula. And he's got a brilliant model. And we're working literally right with them right now as part of their value add on how do you instrument this? And there's two key aspects to, to this. One is leading indicators of customer success, which is what are those metrics that you need to establish to know that you're winning the right kind of customers and they're getting and they're getting very quickly to, to, to value, right? Their time to value is, is short. I think at Slack, it was something like they've sent 2,000 messages. I think in the early, early days of HubSpot, when they had 20 product features, it was using five of those 20 product features within, six, within 60 days. Leading indicators of customer success, critical, because what, what the challenge with a subscription business is, come the renewal in 12 months' time, that's the point at which you really truly know if you have like a product market fit or if you have product customer fit, if you like, right? Yeah. But 12 months to wait 12 months to know if you've got the right customer is a scary amount of time. So building out your leading indicators and tracking them and making sure enough of your new wins are hitting that leading indicator of customer success metric as uh, you know as possible. That's critical. If that metric starts going too red, like it drops below, let's say 60%, put the brakes on. <laughs> Why are suddenly we winning customers that aren't getting time to value, aren't hitting these indicators, leading indicators of customer success quickly enough? Like, stop, because we're baking up a massive churn problem for next year, or we potentially are. And then the second one uh, is like your, your, your product market fit, right? Your, your, um, your, your go to market fit, sorry. Your leading indicators on the commercial side, are they still working, right? Are your conversions working? Are you creating enough top of funnel? Are there conversions to, to, to from, from sales qualified opportunity to closed one? Are they all still true? And if they're true, those leading indicators of, uh, of, of, uh, of go to market and your leading indicators of customer success are all holding true and you, you monitor this month in, month out, then go, go, keep going and go faster and faster and faster and faster and faster. And just keep, keep, keep a, a very close eye on the, the, those, those two, two, two core aspects. It's like your speedometer, basically, of, of growth. But then the, the problem comes right back to what we talked about originally is like, then you need to be finding great people <laughs> with the right skills because you need to be going at like, I'm hiring, I need to hire two reps every single month because all of my metrics are, are holding true. And that's the hard bit because that talent doesn't really kind of exist. And in this, in this world where we have this vast, vast sums of capital now entering the market, the demand on this talent pool is, is, has never been seen before. And, 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 that, and that's, where, that's, where, that's where your problems are going to lie. Well, this then raises the next obvious question, which is if we are suffering from a skills shortage, 
is there a way that we can do more with what we've got? Well, that's the only solution, right? <clears throat> How do we do that? How do we, you know, I was talking to you a bit earlier on before we came on, on the podcast about talking to someone from an accelerator recently and she was talking about her own experiences working in companies and she said you know oh one of the mistakes that we made is we didn't get rid of the useless salespeople quick enough yeah and it made me really tense up and it wound me up that la- even that language wound me up i challenged her on it and i said like <clears throat> i think this is one of the problems in the industry is that everyone blames these useless salespeople who you've hired what was your actual product market fit like? What were your processes like internally? Did you provide good enablement? Did you provide good training in, internally? Maybe it wasn't the useless salespeople. It could have been useless you. <laughs> it could have been useless CEO, product people. It could be the, a useless c- company. My firm belief is that, and there's this wonderful quote that our pre-seed investor said to us, that education is the root solution to all problems. I just think it's a wonderful, wonderful concept and a wonderful, wonderful statement, right? And we all understand the importance of education, right? We, we do. And my, my firm belief is, is, is if an individual has got like the right motivation and they've got the right intellectual capacity, you just need to teach them how to do stuff and they'll be, and they'll be, they'll, and they'll be good at their job. They might not be great at their job, but you know what? Good's probably going to be fine. And we just need to, to, to skill people up through high quality education that's the solution to this to this kind of like talent crisis that we face in, in go to market. It's definitely a, a major contributing factor, but you've touched on a couple of other factors which also need to be built in, which is the culture of the management and leadership. Typically, in order to double your sales, you double your headcount, you double your spam rate, you double your dials, you double your demos, double your number of proposals, and that compounds the brute force mentality and you've suggested that people ask better questions i absolutely agree and i'll go further in that you have to look at how sales affects other parts of the business and is affected by it you need to understand as a salesperson what the moving parts are that are indirectly affected by the decision to bring you in as well as directly and What I'm concerned about is I think a lot of the entry-level sales jobs will disappear over the next 10 years. Then there won't be a way for people to learn unless there is an apprenticeship or something like Sales Impact Academy out there to support them because the managers don't really know how to coach what they know. As we said before, because what they know is is already flawed. (laughs) Yeah. That's your fundamental problem there. (laughs) Yeah, we have to tackle these these parallel problems together. And what, what I see time and again is people wait until the lagging indicators tell them that they fucked up. Then they adjust massively and you know put the bike into a wobble, and they pillage next quarter's pipeline and add tens of thousands of additional cold calls to the SDR's um, tariff. So they then get burnt out. And you end up with this downward spiral because you become well-known for being a hire and fire organization. Then that becomes harder and harder to recruit. Mm -hmm. So I think there are so many different stakeholders, all of whom need to be involved in this conversation. Mm -hmm. But I don't think there's anybody really championing it within most organizations? Well, I think a lot of people, whether they're consciously or unconsciously aware of the problem, are aware of the problem, which kind of maybe neatly um, brings us to my second massive gripe, if you're ready for it. Ready, ready you are. <laughs> I have my first. I know, I, know, I, know you like, I know you like your gripes. So like I say, like, the problem is being exacerbated by the, the insane capital and insane growth that's happening in the, in the industry. We've got a very compromised talent pool because it's, it's lacking in, in, in standards and consistency and all that, kind of, all that kind of stuff, everything we just talked about. So then you go like, okay, well, this has been a problem even, even before this, this exponential kind of like this insane exponential growth in the tech industry. This problem has always existed. And then you go, okay, well, how, how has the problem been solved before? And then you look at that and go, wow. <laughs> and we've all been here before. Like, generally speaking, it's been solved by uh, in-person, expensive, 
uh, often dated old fashioned sales training <laughs> consultancies and companies that, that, that come in. And this is my major gripe with sales training. And we never, ever talk about sales training at Sales Impact Academy because the, the, the connotations of it are so bad. But this will resonate with most people in the industry, which is, and, and I can't even believe some companies do this, but they'll, they'll choose a week in the year. They'll fly all of their teams to some random crappy hotel somewhere. And they'll spend a week with this very expensive sales training company, like being trained, Right through endless PowerPoint presentations and, it, and it's, and, and, you know, for, for a week. Now, the reasons that is just a terrible experience, and some people do it for a day and you, you have the same problems, is the core pedagogy is, is, is disastrous. And, and, and I didn't know what pedagogy meant before I started Sales and Bats Academy, and now I do. It's basically the, the, it's what, it, what, what the word means is, is your method of teaching. Now, Eight hours of PowerPoint is a terrible, terrible way. You will not learn anything. You'll hardly learn it. Your attention will be close to zero, okay? Compound that with the fact that you're there with your buddies getting shit-faced in the evenings, so you're going to be hungover for most days. Compound that again with the fact that you're out the office and you're just going to be looking at your phone. You're getting stressed because you're, you're, you're slipping on your deals. You're not getting back to people. So your mind's not even there anyway. So what you... <laughs> You've got this absurd situation where you've got all these people there at vast expense and nobody is acquiring any knowledge whatsoever. So my belief is that you can, I obviously haven't got any data to back this up, but probably 90% of every penny that's been spent on sales training in the last 50 years was completely useless, purely down to the learning experience. The content, by the way, Marcus, could have been fantastic. But the delivery of it from a learning design perspective, from an instructional design perspective, was just shocking. And it didn't go in. And here's the, the final piece on this, which makes it even more laughable. We don't learn in intense hits of knowledge transfer. That's not how human beings learn. There's a reason at university that you have eight to 10 hours of lectures a week. I remember arriving thinking, why is it so like, there's just not enough, like I can learn quicker than this. The truth is you can't. Human brains don't acquire and embed knowledge that fast. You can't hack that speed, right? It needs to be done over, over time. So like, even if you do acquire some of the knowledge, you, you're, not, you're not reinforcing it. You're not talking about it any, anymore. And very, very soon after that, after that intense week, you'll, f you'll forget most of it. There's no reinforcing going on. There's no checking if you've acquired the knowledge. There's no exams. There's no nothing. So yeah, it's a complete waste of time. So it doesn't actually help. In fact, it actually hinders. And it's cost companies billions and billions and billions and billions, tens of billions, hundreds probably. I always joke that their money would be better spent on lottery tickets. Yeah, or scratch cards. Yeah. So the grim reality is that that, I think, has broken down for several reasons. You've got multiple stakeholders. So you have the commissioning general who might be the VP of sales or the CRO. You have the managers who have to go out and sift and or procurement. And the experience is generally excruciating. Mm -hmm. Then you get to speak to a salesperson who starts asking the wrong questions prematurely. And it's information better volunteered than uh, fingernailed. And there's just so much waste in the whole process because they're spending a lot of time talking to people at the, the wrong time in their cycle. So if you look at what training needs to do, it's got to take into account the users and or the beneficiaries. It's got to take into account the customer, who's almost never part of the whole process. You've got HR, L&D, you might have finance, and all of these should be putting something into the, uh, the process. But by and large, it's just, well, we tried them last year. Let's try these guys. And then everyone's got a slight different, different way of doing it. But I'd, I'd go back to my point, Marcus, which is you just need to absolutely start from the fundamentals, right? This is a when you're training, you're becoming an educator. Now, this is the other big problem. Most companies aren't natural educators. A lot of individuals aren't natural educators either, um, which is another, another problem. And uh, I actually kind of like almost that there's a sort of 
it's kind of an, an analogous to what we're doing at Sales Impact Academy in terms of almost what happened with the CRM industry, right? So if you remember back in like the early 2000s, yeah. lots and lots of companies would just get FileMaker Pro and they'd start building their own CRMs, right? And then suddenly get divert some of their dev resource to building an internal CRM. And then suddenly everyone was like, hang on a minute, we can just use this thing called Salesforce. We're not core. Like, build, building CRMs is not core skill to, to our company. That's crazy. We'll just get a subscription to, sales, to, uh, to Salesforce. They're experts. And you know, that's what we're trying to, you know, there's a parallel with what we're trying to do. It's like, look, you're not natural educators. Don't try and become educators. Don't try and design your own pedagogy or all that kind of stuff. We got you covered there. You just need a subscription to us and, and you're away. We're the, we're, the, we're the education kind of, kind of, kind of, kind of ex, ex, experts. So like I said, it comes down to like, and like I said, at an absolute frontal level, you've got to have strong, good learning design. And again, I think people start on the learning design before they've often identified who their true ideal customers are. And they have only mapped the customer journey from their own side. So that's where you turn up to the scorecard box, place your order, drive up the next window, pay your cash, drive up the next window, and you drive away happy with your food. Whereas the actual customer journey is wildly different. Yeah, well, we actually have, um, obviously, we love our acronyms in our industry. We have one internally called the ILP, which is the Ideal Learner Profile. So, yeah, you have to, like, there's a lot you need to be thinking about as an educator about who you're teaching. And then there's another level of complexity, right, which is that we all learn in slightly different ways, right? Some people are maybe more visual, some people are more, you know, audio. Some people like perhaps learn more through through reading and all that kind of stuff. So there's another level of complexity as well around learning. But at, like I say, at, at its fundamentals, you have to crack that. Okay, another big question. How do we get people to see collaboration as a good thing, not something we should be scared of? Who thinks it's a scary thing, do you think? Salespeople generally do in terms of being very protective over territory and accounts <laughs> and so on. Marketing do because they feel like they're undervalued and they're piling lots of great MQLs, but maybe they're measuring the wrong thing for an MQL and they don't know because they don't talk to sales. We actually did some, some a little bit of research on this and the the the, the revenue loss. I can't remember the source of this, but it's a, it's a it's a true number. Apparently, the revenue loss globally in the industry through the lack of sales and marketing alignment is $1 trillion. Sales and marketing alignment is absolutely key. And I mean, I could go off on a whole, we could do a whole an hour on sales and marketing alignment. <laughs> so we've got plenty of time. <laughs> <laughs> and making sure that you have you have that in place. And there, there are various ways that you do this. Make sure that there are, at a minimum, you've got one-to-ones with your, with your VPs of sales and marketing absolutely make sure that you've got clarity on on definitions within the business make sure you've got clear slas between sales and marketing on things like what qualifies an mql what's the time to response when it when it goes over to sales you know etc 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 like there are just some absolute fundamentals do qbrs together get your teams to be talking together like make sure that there are kind of like one to ones between the teams around sales and marketing make sure that everyone's got empathy and understanding for each other's kind of like roles, all of, all of that kind of good stuff. Okay. You, 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 you and make a good point. Sorry, go on. I'd go one step further that the CS people, customer success need to be involved integrally uh, mm-hmm. to that and early. I, I think in future, given how much more like retail customers, B2B buyers are behaving, it's increasingly important that there's that regular feedback loop from the three main revenue operation departments. And it also feeds into product development and into leadership so that they can make better judgments in terms mm-hmm. of their cranky decisions. Because the experience of previously loyal customers can be tested quite quickly. And you make a very good point. And then there needs to be very strong sales and customer success alignment uh dan steinman he's one of our coaches he's i mean he wrote probably one of the first sort of seminal books on customer success called customer success you know he's the chief evangelist over at gainsight very deep thinker in in the space lovely guy 
he's a very strong um, strong uh, advocate for having a very uh, separate customer, you know, a chief customer officer. So you don't put customer success under the CRO. You have them very much as a peer. As a CEO, for me, like on, a, on a, just a very basic level, I don't want to be two steps away from my customers. I want to be able to talk to my customer success, my VP of customer success or my chief customer, customer officer, and, and be very, very close to the customers because it's cr- like critical. Your churn metrics, your NDR metrics, all of that kind of stuff have such a massive impact on valuation. You have to be, as a CEO, close to your customers, talking to your customers. And having them two steps away from you from, in, in, in a reporting line perspective is less, less than ideal. But here's the other thing, going back to the alignment between sales and customer success. You know, if uh, if customer success reports into the, into the CRO, and you know a few things are going a bit wonky, or you're starting to win customers that aren't ICP, the expectations of onboarding or product expectations are being set incorrectly. You know, if you've got a peer relationship, you can have that kind of like positive friction. The CCO can go down to the CRO's office and say, or on a Zoom call, and say, "Look, we need to talk about this." Like this is becoming a, a major problem. We're winning the wrong customers. Expectations are being set incorrectly. It needs to get it needs to get fixed because it's really affecting our um, our kind of like core core metrics and it's affecting team and efficiencies and everything else. If that CS person is reporting into this the CRO, it's a much less effective conversation because that person's reporting into the CRO, and it wouldn't it wouldn't be treated as as, as, as seriously. Sure. And there's the other factor that they become part of the revenue function. Yeah. Whereas I think we we need that internal friction to find the best common areas of common ground. And I can see why that would be an incredibly healthy setup. Okay, very interesting. Worth the price of admission for that. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> it's a pleasure. Um, you can, well, what often happens or can happen is you, and again, this is, this is a, 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 again, going back to lack of standards in the industry. Splitting out customer success and account management and having your account management function focused on, you know, cross-sell, upsell, and in some cases, renewals, and separating that from customer success is a very, very, very smart thing to do. Customer success should be really focused on time to value, continuous value from the product, you know, strong relationship building, finding opportunities for growth, but slinging it back to the account management fun- team. And that I probably, when that goes to some scale, that can sit potentially under the, under the CRO, but the customer success function has got to be separate from the revenue function. If anyone's listened before, you'll be used to my usual rant that the customer's been forgotten. And we need to instill this concept of buyer safety in everything we do. And it's starting to get a little bit of traction. But there are so many vested interests stacked against it. And I'm curious, is there a a particular psychographic or persona that you would target uh, to have these more risky, scary, uncertain conversations with? The customers, as in the commercial conversations? Yeah, I mean, I'm curious who you're targeting because... You know, I always maintain 3% of my total addressable market can tolerate my ghastly behavior and their vile personality. So it's them that I write for. Anyone else who gets some value out of it is great. Um, but I, I know only a fraction of the market can tolerate working with me. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe as well just fess up. <laughs> <laughs> Are you asking what's the persona of an account manager? No, I'm asking what's the persona of a prospect. What are their qualities? What are their characteristics? What you're selling into? That you're selling into. Oh, us as a business. Yeah, because you know, oh. you'll, you'll, you'll have ones who are fossilized mm-hmm. and have no desire or inclination to change. And mm-hmm. then there's another group, and I'm just curious who you're aiming at. Oh, as a business of Sales Impact Academy, we're focused at the moment very much on venture backed companies they've they've got they've got they have to grow and they've signed the contract essentially with the VC to say we're going to grow fast when we're going to scale and so there's the imperative is there and we're sort of series A to series C is like the absolute sweet spot but we've actually just started winning some some pretty significant enterprise customers as well but 
it's B two B tech at the moment for us is 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 the is the absolute is the absolute focus where there's an imperative to grow because that's that's where things start to get wonky in in fast growth. Okay, and what are the blind spots that you have to be aware of in the hyper growth setup? I think that you need to know the stages that you're in as a company from seed through to like your first 10 customers through to through to a million in ARR through to scaling to 10 through to scaling to 100 like you need to be aware and have an un- a deep understanding of what the structure of the teams and what your expenditure almost as well should look like at each of those kind of key 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 stages, and that's fundamental. I don't think there's enough un, like accepted, understood, standardized knowledge around 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 that, and it causes chaos. People are hiring VPs of sales before they've got any customers. They're not bringing in marketing soon enough. They're certainly not bringing customer success in soon enough, and you've suddenly got fifty customers that haven't been talked to for nine months. So. That's a huge one. What's the what's the optimum team structure and makeup as you go through those kind of like phases of phases of scaling? And they're dramatically different. And the role of the CEO in all those phases dramatically changes. Where could one find out about those uh, different stages? We teach some of that at Sales Impact Academy, but I think uh, David Scott um, has got some great stuff on on his site for entrepreneurs. It's How do you spell Scott? S K O K. Just David Scott. <laughs> <laughs> Just go there. Go to fourentrepreneurs.com, I think it is. He's got a lot around these different these different stages. And he's a he's a uh, the Matrix partners. Uh, he was an early investor in HubSpot. Um he's a really, really nice guy. He came on and did an event for, for us at Sales Impact Academy um earlier on this year or sort of late late last year. But he does a lot around these different these different stages of, of scaling. Okay. Back to the question about blind spots though. I'm I'm curious for a company that's managed to get their first you know, reasonable chunk of money. In that phase, what are the blind spots that they need to be aware of because they're useful leading indicators too? I think almost the absolute most important one is the one we've already covered, right? Which is how fast should you go? And what often happens, and this is this is driven a lot by VCs as well, and this is, this is something that Mark, Mark Roberts talks about a lot, which is, Great, you just go and raise, you know, your massive Series A of thirty million or a Series B of fifty million, whatever it might be. And the temptation now is to your point, like, oh, I've got this spreadsheet. I've got ten reps. If I have thirty reps, then I'll, I'll, you know, I'll triple my revenue. Simples, right? And you go off and you basically <laughs> hire twenty reps in the, in the space of a month. And it, it's it, it's it's often an absolute disaster, and you're not instrumenting the business properly. And what happens is you start to like the discipline goes, the culture goes, you start winning the wrong customers, customer success gets pissed off. You start to develop a big churn problem. Your net dollar retention metric dips below 100. And suddenly, even though you've raised a lot of capital, you're burning like crazy. But then you can't raise capital because everyone's going, oh, your NDR is like 80%. So basically, you're bas- you're shrinking. <laughs> so uh, we're not we're not we're not going to back you, and then the company runs out of cash. So it's absolutely critical to to know how fast you should grow or slow, and it goes down to those two things: what are your leading indicators of customer success, yeah. and what are those leading indicators of unit economics? And that's your speedometer, right? Are your you know on the leading indicators of unit, unit, unit economics are your are those metrics holding true? Are you hitting your SQO targets? Are you hitting your top of funnel metrics? Are you getting enough MQLs? Are the conversions through the funnel working? Great. If they are, that's good. But it's only half the story. What are your leading indicators of customer success saying? Are those, have you got enough green? A 60, 70, 80 odd percent, whatever it is, and it ranges with different, different like markets you're going after. Is there enough? Is there enough green? Are customers getting good time to value? They're getting value out of the product quickly enough, based on those leading indicators of customer success. If they are, go keep going faster and faster and faster. That's the core blind spot. Understood. Okay. So what you said suggests that you need to spend a goodly proportion of your time as the leader and as part of the leadership team in planning. You need to be designing the business you're going to become. You need to understand the triggers 
And so what's really key is making sure that you are prepared for the change Mm -hmm. and that in doing that, you're recruiting ahead of where you Mm -hmm. need to be. There's also the other key key aspect of this is making sure you've got a really good, strong revenue operations function. And that's the other big, big mistake I see all the time, which is you don't have good enough RevOps support that's, that's, that's giving you the the infrastructure and the analytics and the data and the measurement to be making sure that you've got all this right. Okay. That's another huge pothole I see all the time, people just not investing enough in RevOps. Paul, thank you. We've come to time. How can people get hold of you? I guess that LinkedIn is, is a good one. So just search for Paul Fifield Sales Impact Academy. You can email me at paul at salesimpact.io. And uh, yeah. Those two are probably the best best ways of getting in contact. Excellent. And one final bit of advice that you'd whisper in your 23-year-old idiot self here. I would say two things. I'd say only work in scalable business models, ideally with purpose. Again, I've worked in non-scalable business models, and it's really hard work. And your multiples on the, on the, on the business are just, are just terrible. And then I think the other thing I'd say is that culture is absolutely everything. And there's a famous phrase like the culture eats strategy for breakfast, Peter Drucker. My 23-year-old self would have just scoffed at that. Um, my 45-year-old self would say it's absolutely key. It's fundamental. Excellent. Paul Fifield, thank you. Thank you very much, Marcus. This is Marcus Kauke signing off once again from the Inquisitor podcast. If you want to get hold of me, marcus at laughs In the meantime, stay safe and happy selling. Bye-bye.